Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos to discuss things that will help you improve your chess game. We've had over a hundred and I guess this is around number 108 or nine or so in the past few months. And today I thought I'd talk a little bit about chess psychology. What brought this up? Uh, I have a book that was published in English in 1972 by Grandmaster Nikolai Krogius. And uh, I assume he wrote it sometime recently before that because he does have references to the late 60s, but it was translated to English in 1972. And in this book, he talks about a lot of things that I've talked about over the years and we've had previous videos to cover some of these subjects like quiescence errors and retain image errors. And I thought I would devote sort of an overview video to not only what Krogius is talking about in his book, but maybe the wider subject of chess psychology. And this is a gigantic subject because chess is a thinking game. So just as thought process and time management are monstrously big issues in chess, if you don't have a good thought process, if you don't have good time management, then playing a time chess game can be a disaster. Chess psychology covers a very wide range of chess and chess errors. In fact, you could argue that maybe the predominant number of chess errors are due to some form of chess psychology, especially if we use that term in its widest sense. So I'd like to at least pick up with some of the issues that Krogius talks about in his book and a few of the issues that I talk about in some of my previous books and articles as well. So let's start with um, that idea of retained image. Retained image happens a lot. The, the chess skill we're talking about is visualization. Visualization is when you're analyzing a position and you make moves in your head and you have to imagine that those moves were played and think of what the position would look like. So that skill is called visualization. In this position, I've seen several people make a retained image error and I'll give you the moves and I'll explain the error. So in this position, I talk about the safety of the move knight takes e5. And one of the lines that comes up sometimes is knight takes e5, queen to e7, pinning the knight to the king. This is a seat of tactical destruction. The fact that the knight and the king are on the same file, which means if you put a queen or a rook there, maybe you can either pin them or double attack them. So after knight takes e5, queen e7 becomes a candidate move. And when I discuss that move, and I ask people, you know, what, what's white going to do about that? Sometimes they come up with moves like f4, or bishop f4, you know, just simply guarding the knight, which are reasonable tries. And then I, I say, well, what, what's black going to do if white just guards that knight? And one of the moves they mention is bishop to d6. And they say, all right, knight takes e7, queen e7, sorry, knight takes e5, queen e7, you know, bishop f4, bishop d6. And I say something like, okay, well, uh, what do you think would happen there? And they discuss whether or not they can save the knight. And then finally they come to some conclusion and I say, would you like to try it? And they say, sure. And I say, okay, you play the most for black, I'll play the most for white and we'll see if your conclusion was correct. So I play knight takes e5, they play queen e7, I play the move they suggested, whatever it was, bishop f4. And now they're supposed to play bishop d6. Well, they can't do it because the queen's in the way. This error, uh, Grandmaster Krogius called the retained image error. What, who's being retained? Well, what's happening is you're looking ahead and you're retaining the queen on the d8 square, even though it's moved to the e7 square. So you're looking at a board where the queen is not on e7 and you're retaining it on d8, even though you've, um, you've imagined the move queen e7. And therefore, when you get to the position where it's time to move the bishop on f8, if you retain the queen on d8, then you'll think that bishop d6 is a legal move because in the current position, bishop d6 is a legal move. It's just that only later in your analysis when the queen's already moved to e7 that the bishop becomes blocked. So Grandmaster Krogius calls that a retained image error. And that's a very common error for people that have problems with visualization is they have the incorrect position in their head. Now, even, even I do this occasionally. If you've watched all the videos where I played against the computer, I think out of the eight ones I played out loud for you here on YouTube, 
I think once or twice I caught myself in the eight games making a visualization error of a retained image. And I even said it at the time. I said, oh, I can't do that. There's a retained image there. And I explained exactly you know, why I did that. So even, even at the higher levels, people can make a retained image error. It's just obviously as you get down to lower levels, you get more retained image errors. Okay, let's, let's get away from talking about that kind of error. Let's talk about um, masks and filters. Masks and filters are things that you do that block your clear thinking of everything that should be going on in your head. So you put restrictions on things that don't exist. In real life, we do this all the time. We always do things that are, you know, rather than doing anything, we do the things that are more careful, that are well chosen. And in chess, you usually want to do that too for sake of efficiency, but sometimes it, it doesn't work that way. Let's, let's look at position number 30 here. Okay, this is from a student game. And here's an example of a, of a mask or a filter. Um, sometimes I use the English term unguarded. You know, in chess we have terms like loose or hanging, but if we want to talk about an English term that is equivalent, we could say unguarded. When I say equivalent, it's not exactly the same. Here's an example. <clears throat> I say to people, if white plays knight to c3, name all the white pieces that are unguarded. Okay, so if you want to try it yourself, you can stop the video and try to answer it. Well, after knight to c3, if we had to name all the white pieces that are unguarded, the answer left to right is the rook on a1 is unguarded, the pawn on c2 is unguarded, the pawn on d4 is unguarded, and the king on g2 is unguarded. At this point, I hear howls and screams and people say, what are you talking about the king's unguarded? You, you can't guard a king. Well, of course you can guard a king, the, but the point is guarding a king doesn't mean anything because in chess, no one can capture your king, so you can't recapture it, so guarding it doesn't mean anything. But that doesn't mean that the king is neither unguarded nor guarded. The answer is, well, it's one of the two. It's either guarded or it's unguarded. In this case, the king is unguarded. Again, I agree. It doesn't mean anything from a chess term that you guard a king, but the king is an unguarded piece. If I went further and I said, well, name all the loose pieces or all the hanging pieces, and your definition of hanging was like an unguarded piece that might be subject to double or attack or being taken off, then of course the king cannot be a hanging piece, the king cannot be a loose piece, but it, it can be an unguarded piece. So that's an example of a kind of mask causing a filter where you're filtering out the fact that an unguarded king is rarely spoken about in chess because it doesn't make any sense in terms of wh whether you need to guard a king or not, but literally the king is unguarded. So, and what I found when I give this question to people of different rating levels is the lower the rating of the player, the more likely they're gonna get upset or they're not gonna say the king is unguarded. A higher rated player much more quickly will say, Oh, Dan, you want all the unguarded pieces? Okay, it's the rook on a1, the pawn on c2, the pawn on d4. And of course, the king on g2 is unguarded, but that doesn't mean anything, but okay, it's unguarded. So, so good players are much quicker to turn off those kind of filters so that they include what you're asking for in something like this. And that helps them when they're playing chess. It helps them to avoid quiescence errors because rather than filtering things out right away, they take things into account. Like when, when people see a quiescence error, a lot of lower players see moves and they say, I can't do that because he'll do this. Good players don't do that. They say, normally I can't do this because of that, but if I can get away with it, I can get something. So I'm not gonna stop there. I'm gonna look a little further and see if it's worth it because if it is, then maybe I do wanna give up a rook for a knight or a knight for a pawn or whatever it is that normally I don't wanna do because I wanna see if in this case it's worth it. So they don't, just filter all those things out. This is also the answer to the question, which is why do so many inter intermediate players do so much better on puzzles than they would do in the same position in a game? And the answer is they make quiescence errors. In a, in a puzzle, the author is telling you white to play and win, in which case you don't stop till you find a win. And if that includes sacrificing a rook for a pawn or a rook for a knight, well, then you just go ahead and do it and you keep looking to see if that's the win. 
In a game, a good player does exactly the same thing, but lower rated players tend to stop and say, oh, I can't give up that rook for the knight. They, they filter out those moves. While in, when there's a puzzle and the puzzle's telling them not to filter, then they don't do it. Let's take another example. Uh, let's bring up number uh, 50. I think that's the right number. I guess it would help if I typed into the right place here. Okay, so here, suppose I said to you, well, first you could answer, what move would you play here for white? You could answer that question first. And after you answer that question, you could even pause the video and answer that question. The second question I would ask people would be, list all of white's checks. Okay, well, when, when people are listing checks, they have a tendency to filter out the obviously unsafe checks. So here, white has bishop g5 check, queen g5 check, queen h4 check, queen takes g7 check, and queen a3 check. What happens is when I give people this puzzle, they see bishop g5 check right away. They see queen g5 check right away. They see queen h4 check right away. They miss queen takes g7 check sometimes because they filter it out and they say, oh, well, that's not safe. I, I wouldn't do that. So they, they don't list it as a check, even though it's just as much a check as all the other moves. It's, it's similar to the previous question about the king being unguarded. Yes, the king was unguarded, but it didn't mean anything, but it's still unguarded. Here, queen takes g7 check is a check. It may be a terrible check, maybe a terrible move, but it's just as much of a check as queen g5 or queen h4 or bishop g5. And the other check, which is a psychological thing too, is queen a3 check. Queen a3 is the final check. And the reason it's harder to see is because it's on the other side of the board and there's so much action happening on the king side that psychologically your brain is, is pulled over to the king side and most like bishop g5 check jump out at you right away while it takes a little bit of effort to look around the board and find a move like queen a3 check. I've heard psychologists say that in chess, the, long, the, the longer moves like queen a3 check are the harder moves to find and the hardest moves to find are, are diagonal retreats that are long distance. So if you have to bring a bishop back from h6 all the way back to c1, that's a very difficult kind of move to see. So diagonal retreats of long distance are difficult, but any long distance move is harder to see than short distance moves. So here, if you're listing checks, my guess would be that you'll find queen g5, queen h4, and bishop g5 first. You'll see queen takes g7. Even weaker players see that. You know, I have to encourage them a little. When they'll say to me, uh, well, do you want me to really include queen takes g7? I mean, it's not safe. And I go, yes, right now we're just listing checks. We're, we're not talking about the goodness of the moves. We're talking about is it a check or isn't it? And then they'll find queen a3 check. So again, these are, these are psychological issues that people have. Now, playing too slow and playing too fast are also psychological issues. And I'm not going to spend much time in this video talking about people who played too fast or people who played too slow because I just had two videos completely um, given over to those two subjects. So I have a video called slowing down for people who played too fast and I have a, another video called speeding up for people who played too slow. So those are psychological problems. They belong in our list of things that we're going to talk about in today's video, but I really don't want to spend too much time on them. One of the things that Krogius talks about in, in, in great extent in his book is the effect of time pressure on a player. And I'm not gonna go into all the different things he does. In fact, I'll, I'll read you some of the issues he talks about. He talks about um, time pressure, a psychological phenomenon, inadequate theoretical preparation, inadequate practical preparation, objective complexity of the situation, conscious entry into time pressure, analytical doubts. Some of the things that Rousen talked about in his book, um, uh, Not Chess for Zebras, the other book, The Seven Deadly Chess Sins. Okay, uh, Krogius goes on and he talks about thinking under the conditions of time pressure, dynamics of mental processes, tendency to external obviousness, direct naturalness of the pending decision, tendency to rely upon the relatively stable and static elements of a position and so on. So he talks a, a lot about time pressure. 
So I'd like to talk about one issue in time pressure, which is if your opponent is in time pressure and you have a lot of time, should you play fast or should you take your time? Well, I don't want to go into every issue involved with that, but I've seen people make this mistake, even good players, many times. What they do is they consistently play fast when they're, let, let's say they have 27 minutes left for the game and their opponent only has, you know, 30 seconds. They'll start playing fast with the idea that I don't want to give my opponent time to think while I'm thinking. Okay, well, th this is a very common error. In fact, I heard of this error talked about in a, a back end book I was recently reading where you make a false comparison. So the question is, if you start playing faster when your opponent's in time pressure, is that to your benefit or his benefit in the sense that you have the extra time if you need it and you don't want to give him that time to try to drive him over on time? And the answer is, okay, well, clearly that's on your benefit in the sense that you can always slow down if you need to, and he can't. So the extra time that you have in your pocket is to your advantage. But just because that makes some sense, it doesn't overcome the much more important that factor, which is that when you play slow and he plays fast, you can play much, much better moves. And that's even more to your advantage than playing fast. So they're both to your advantage because you have a lot more time. It's just that one's a little bit to your advantage and the other's much more to your advantage. Now, obviously, if you have a forced move, you don't want to spend a lot of time on it because your opponent will know what move you're going to play and then he can think efficiently on your time. But if you've ever been in time pressure and your opponent takes some time, you'll know that you can't guess exactly what he's going to do. Let's say he has three or four plausible moves and you're sitting there trying to guess which one he's going to play and what you're going to do about it. And meanwhile, your opponent is more and more thinking, oh, I'm, I'm narrowing down to this move and what's going to happen here. And you don't know that. So the person in time pressure is much, much, much less efficient on thinking in his opponent's time on doing specific analytical work. So when your opponent gets into time pressure, unless you have fairly forced moves or really obvious moves, it's tremendously disadvantaged to play faster. When I say disadvantage, I don't mean it, it, it's worse than it if you do nothing at all, but it's worse than if you play normally and play slow. So one is slightly to your advantage and the other is much to your advantage. So there are some circumstances where playing faster when your opponent's in time trouble might make sense, but most, the, the overwhelming majority of the time it's not. I have seen so many games that amateurs have played, I, I can't even tell you how many games, where the one side started playing fast because they got into time pressure and the other side, who had plenty of time, started playing fast, too, for a variety of reasons. One, they just saw their opponent playing fast, or they thought it was the right thing to do, or whatever it was, they started playing fast. And the person who had more time was not losing. They were equal or better. And then th when they started playing fast, they threw the whole game away. Much more often than, than it, it, it backfired so much more often than it worked, it wasn't even funny. But yet you know, people keep doing this because psychologically it seems like it might be a reasonable thing to do. And I understand why it seems that way, but it's just not, you know, you want to, if you have the time, then you want to take it, even if you, it allows your opponent to, to think on your time, because you're just going to be much, much, much more efficient when you do that. Now, there is one exception. Suppose you're losing desperately. Suppose you have 27 minutes left and you're in a position where you could resign, but you don't want to resign because your opponent only has 30 seconds left. Let's say you're playing with a short increment, like a five second time delay or a five second increment, and he only has 30 seconds left. Or let's say for some reason you're playing without an increment. Well, then you don't want to resign, but if you're dead lost, you don't want to give him time to think about what he can do to beat you. You don't mind randomizing the game because you have nothing to lose when you're dead lost. So if you're dead lost and you're in a resignable position and you have a lot of time on your clock and your opponent has very little, then playing fast is a really, really, really good idea. In fact, the, the, the USCF rules say that you have to keep score until one side gets less than five minutes left. And I tell my students, but if you have more than five minutes and your opponent has less than five minutes, you should always keep score unless you're dead lost then you want to blitz your opponent. If you're dead, if your opponent has less than five minutes left and you're dead lost, but you're not resigning because he's low on time and you have a lot of time, 
then you should stop keeping score, then you should play fast. That's the only exception is when one side is very, very low on time, the other side has a lot of time. The person with a lot of time should continue to record the game, should continue taking a reasonable amount of time, unless they're dead lost, then go ahead and blitz. It's, it's quite the right thing to do in that, that one case. Okay, so just psychology, let's go to the next step. We're going to look at uh, rating fear. We could have uh, you know, a 10 hour discussion on rating fear. I think the rating system is great, but the fact that they gave it to everybody and everybody became so rating fixated became one of the biggest psychological problems in chess. And I'm not gonna get into all the things that people do with ratings on how they, they offer people draws when they're winning because they're playing a higher rated player. They would never do that if they hadn't invented the rating system. They would just try to beat the guy. You know, they think, oh, I'll, I'll get my two rating points instead of trying to play for a win and getting your 18 rating points for beating the guy. They, they take the draw and take their two rating points. These are all psychological issues, but the two I wanted to talk about were playing lower rated players and playing higher rated players. And again, we could do a whole videos on these things. But when you're playing higher rated players, you can't play with fear. A lot of times I ask people, if you play a 100 game match against someone 100 points higher rated than you, how many points should you score? Well, according to the USAF rating system, the ELO system, if, if, you have a, if both players are accurately rated and one is 100 points higher than the other, the score of a 100 point match should be 64 to 36. You should get 36% of the points. That doesn't mean you're gonna win 36% of the games, because draws count as a half a point. You might draw, you know, 40 games to get 20 points and win another 16. 40 and 16 is 56 and lose the other 44. But that's what you would expect when there's a 100 rating point difference. If there's a 200 rating point difference, you would expect the higher player to win 76 points and the lower player to win 24 points. But a lot of times people misguess this. They're so afraid of higher players. If I say, if you play a 100 game match against someone 100 points higher, how many games would you win? They'll say something like 10. Well, there's a giant difference between winning 36 points and winning 10 points. 10 points is way, 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 way too low. That's as if the opponent was more like 400 points higher rated than 100 points. So they're, they're unreasonably afraid of people like that. And when, they, when you're unreasonably afraid of people that are higher rated, then you make losing a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, you play chess in such a way that you make it easier to lose because you think you're going to lose. This is just a uh, very typical psychology. How about playing lower rated players? Well, two of the things that people do wrong when they play lower rated players are, one, they play too fast because they figure, ah, why should I put the effort in against this guy? He's going to give me the game anyway. And what happens is they still win most of the games, but not as many as they should. We just said that people 400 points higher rated should win like 91% of the points. Let's say you're 400 points higher rated than someone and you take them lightly and you play too fast. Well, you're still going to win most of the games for sure, but maybe you only win 86% instead of 91%. If you're happy with that, fine, but that's less than what you should because you played too fast. And you under the other thing that you can do to burst someone is underestimate them. For instance, instead of making good moves, you can make cheap threats with the idea that I'll make cheap threats that are easily met and my opponent's no good he'll fall for one of them sooner or later, and you know then I'll beat him. Well, that's a, that's a terrible way to play chess, and it's certainly not a good habit to get into if you're gonna play better players, and you always wanna play the best you can. And yes, against some really terrible players, that kind of strategy might get you some faster wins because they'll fall for some of these cheap threats. But in the long run, that's actually playing pretty poor chess, and it's not only gonna hurt you in the long run, but your chances of winning that game even would go down if your opponent actually manages to find some reasonable moves and then your cheap threats turn into not so good moves. So playing higher rated players, playing lower rated players, lots of psychology involved with the rating system that I wanna go into too much. Okay, so we've talked about, we really only scratched the surface for chess psychology. As I said at the start of the video, there's chess is a mental game, so your psychology of the game you know, your attitude when you're playing, your aggressiveness, uh, you know, how you're going to view your moves. A lot of these things have psychological components. So much so, as I said, we could include a large part of the game with this. So psychology in chess is just as big an issue as your chess thought process, your time management, 
these are all really, really important chess issues. And the more you understand about how your brain works when you're playing, what you should be thinking, what your psychology should be, what are some of the errors that you can make, how to avoid those errors, these are all important things to do. All right, if you liked today's video, give it a like. I usually get about 10% likes, but that's okay. A lot of people wouldn't like a video if you paid them to like the video, that's okay. And if you're in interested in my channel, then you can subscribe to the channel. We had a, a big contest uh, a couple months back where I give out two free lessons to two of the subscribers to, to uh, commemorate a thousand subscribers to the channel. So I'd like to thank everybody for, for subscribing and liking the videos. And, you know, I'm putting out about roughly one or two a week right now, depending on how my voice holds out. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.